Welcome to another edition of Wellness Webinars, a series of 14 timely presentations on coping with quarantine and COVID-19, brought to you by Carolina Behavioral Health Alliance and Mood Treatment Center. Today's presenters are Heather Herman, a nurse practitioner, and Dr. Chris Aiken, a psychiatrist. And today's topic, psychiatric medications, your question. All right, welcome to today's webinar. We are going to be discussing psychiatric medications and the format for today is really going to be heavily focused on trying to answer the questions that patients most often have when they come to their appointments. My name is Heather Herman. I am a nurse practitioner with the Mood Treatment Center, and I have joining with me today Dr. Aiken, who is a practicing psychiatrist and the medical director for the Mood Treatment Centers. So we are going to hopefully dispel some myths, um, hopefully answer some questions for things that maybe you read about or Googled or heard from friends and family. And we're going to be pausing throughout the set webinar to take questions um, that might be most important to you. So if you have a question please feel free to send that in if you're not sure how to send in questions you can do that on a desktop looking at the bottom right corner of your screen and if you're using a phone a smartphone you may use the question button and that will let you submit your questions if you are also using a smartphone to view this webinar, to toggle between the view of the presenter, myself, or the slides, you actually just need to swipe your screen. All right, let's get started. So when we think about mental health treatment and evaluation, one of the most common complaints that we hear from people suffering from mental illness and mental illness symptoms is I feel miserable. And they may come to us having already tried medication. They may be treatment naive, meaning they've never actually been involved in, in healthcare from a mental health standpoint. And when we get started, there's some key differences from mental illness and physical illness. Now, they are absolutely interconnected, and mental illness can cause physical symptoms and vice versa. But what I'm referring to is actually the way that we evaluate, diagnose, and treat mental illness with medications. And so there's a few key points that you want to remember when we think about medications just getting started. One of those things that's really important to understand is actually the goal of medication management when we're talking about mental illness. And the goal for mental health treatment is actually to help the patient with as few medications as possible feel like themselves again. And what I mean by that, because a lot of times people don't know, they maybe have had symptoms for so long that they say, I don't even know what that would feel like actually. So what I mean by that is that we want patients to be able to experience the full range of human emotions, meaning that the good days feel good and the bad days feel bad. That's just part of the normal human experience. But that whatever they are experiencing, that they are able to remain functional, meaning that they can eat, they can sleep, and they can interact with their loved ones in a way that recognizes and respects their values and that they can maintain employment and work so that they can have financial security and have recreational opportunities that they enjoy. So the goal with medication management for mental health is a little bit different than what you might have encountered when you are doing medical treatment for physical illnesses where the goal might be cure or it might be complete resolution. When it comes to mental illness, what we're really going to be looking at is evaluating our effectiveness is, is how the patient is doing from a functionality standpoint, all right? So that said, in order for us to use as few medications as possible, it's really important that we remember that mental health medications should not be used to chase every bad day or every uncomfortable symptom. If we do that, patients are gonna end up on a lot more medication than they need, and that's really not the goal. The third thing that's really important to remember about medication management 
is that all medications have some risks and have some potential for side effects. And there is no scenario where we want people to have to trade one problem for another. So we don't ideally want to have to give medication for medication, and we don't want anyone to feel like they gave up one symptom just in return for another. So the key to that is to stay connected with your mental health provider. So all medicines have the risk for side effects, but we actually have a lot of things that we can do to mitigate that risk and to make sure that patients can actually tolerate their medications. So I hear patients all the time that will say, I, my previous prescriber gave me X medication and it made me have whatever side effect, nausea, headaches, fatigue, whatever. And so I just stopped taking it. I just couldn't put up with that. And I understand that completely. That is so common. It is human nature. The trick is, though, that a lot of times that could have been avoided and patients could have gotten to feeling better faster if they had just communicated so that we can make sure that if there are side effects, we're managing those well. OK, and managing side effects can oftentimes be done without medication. So the last thing that's really important to know when we think about medications, it's a little bit different for mental health medications, is that they don't always work right away. And they sometimes have to be taken on a long-term basis. That's not true for all the medications, but oftentimes it's true. And it's different from medications that we use for medical reasons. And so one of the things that we want to find when we're doing medication management is we want to find that balance of making sure that we don't rush too fast so that somebody ends up on medication more than they need to or that they change their medications around so fast that they've tried six things but none of them had time to work um, and we also want to make sure that we don't stop the medication before somebody's had a full treatment course so that's a really important part of medication management that's different than what people maybe have been used to in the past. And when we're talking about that, the thing that you want to know is that we may ask that people come back in more often when we're doing medication management for mental illness, at least in that initial period until we know we have a good fit. And then at that point, those visits really get spaced out and it becomes much less often that you have to see your medication provider. So. That said, those are some quick and dirty rules that will help medication management go better. Let's talk about the medications a little bit more. So the good news about, about medication is that we actually have a lot of different things and tricks and tools in our box that we can use to help patients feel better. And so when we think about that, it is a little bit of a trial and error to find the right fit. And sometimes what we're looking at is actually a combination of medications. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is that not all things in mental health are best treated with medication. One of the important parts, even of the medication plan, is actually going to be psychotherapy. So let's talk about that a little bit more. All right, so the question that I get most often when I, as a medication provider, tell my patient that they, I think, would benefit from psychotherapy is, do I have to? And I hear that a lot. Um, psychotherapy can be something that can be really daunting because the idea that we have from the media, from movies, from hearing from friends, or maybe even from our own previous experience, can lead us to thinking about psychotherapy in a very narrow view. And the reality is, is that psychotherapy is, is complex. Therapists are trained in multiple modalities, and they actually have just as many tools in their box as the medication providers. And a lot of their tools can actually work well with medication. So one of the things that I hear from patients a lot is, I don't really want to have to take a medication if I really don't need to. And what they really sometimes mean by that is, I don't want to need a medication. And therapists are really good at helping patients understand when that time might be that they need to come and consider medication as part of their plan of care. And actually, a lot of our referrals come from therapists. The flip side of that is also true. There are times 
when we have really done our best effort with medication and the symptoms that are persisting are going to be better treated with therapy. And therapy can be an avenue to help patients need fewer medications. So I know it seems kind of unusual to talk about therapy in a presentation about medications, but the two are very interconnected and they work very well together. So if therapy is such an important part of the medication plan, we use it to help patients know when to take medication, we use it to help patients explore reasons they might be ambivalent about medication, or maybe why they're having failures with medication, maybe they're forgetting their medication, or they just are struggling with actually taking medication. Um, so if it's so important, why is it so hard? And why do so many people start with that question of, do I have to? <laughs> and I think that there's a lot of really legitimate reasons that patients have for not wanting to go to therapy. And a lot of those can be overcome by working with your medication provider. When your medication provider recommends therapy, they're doing that intentionally. They are going to refer you to a provider who is trained in a type of therapy that's going to be most beneficial and evidence-based for the symptoms and the conditions that you are dealing with, okay? And so there's a few tricks that make therapy be a little bit more effective and a little more comfortable for patients. So because it's so important and it's such an important part of the treatment plan, I want to make sure that I share those with you. So the first thing that I encourage patients to do is to remember that even if they have not had a good fit with therapy before, it doesn't mean that they won't have a good fit in the, in the future and their medication provider can really help them get connected to the right therapist. So if you saw a therapist in the past or you did therapy in the past and it didn't work well for you, you wouldn't not go, right? So if it, if it were your knee and we were talking about knee rehab and the physical therapy wasn't doing well, you wouldn't say, well, I'm never going to do physical therapy again. That wouldn't be reasonable. And the same thing is true for for psychotherapy. And the way that we get past that is to have really good open communication with your therapist. So the thing to remember is that therapists appreciate feedback. They're trained in multiple modalities and they are glad to adjust and accommodate for your needs. And that's something that you'll actually negotiate together. Okay. I encourage people when they're considering therapy to give it at least three sessions before they decide that they don't have a good fit. And I encourage them to give open feedback and to understand that even as part of their medication plan, I'm always going to check in on how they're doing with therapy. And if there's anything that I can do to assist with that process, they just need to let me know. And I'm going to be glad to facilitate that. Okay. So, when you go into therapy and you feel like therapy is overwhelming, I have had patients tell me before that they feel almost even traumatized by therapy. Therapy is work. There is no doubt about that. But therapy does not have to be intolerable. That doesn't mean it might not be uncomfortable, but it doesn't have to be intolerable. And when therapy is intolerable, that's the time that you need to check in with your therapist and your medication provider, because it might be that the stalling that you're running into with therapy could be treated with medication. For example, if a patient is too depressed to engage, they feel so slowed and exhausted with their depression. They're not going to be able to do the work of therapy and medication maybe can help with that. If they are suffering from ADHD and they are so unfocused, they cannot follow a word that their therapist is saying. That's the time that medication might be an important component of the therapy. OK, so they're very interconnected and we want our patients to have the best comprehensive, holistic care that they can. And so that is why therapy is actually even a part of the medication plan. OK. So let's move on into the medications. I know that this is what you are most interested in. And before we go much further, I'm gonna actually have Dr. Aiken give us a little bit of background information because there's some things about medication that apply to all medications that I actually get asked quite a bit. So Dr. Aiken, if you don't mind, could you share with our audience a little bit about the difference between generic medications and brand medications? And can you also talk to patients about strategies as far as cost with that? 
And also, one of the questions I get most often from patients is, why can't I just do that genetic testing to tell me what will work? And then you can just give me that. So if you don't mind, maybe can you share with us a little bit some of those broader, big medication issues that patients ask about? Yes, thank you, Heather. And it's an honor to work with Heather, who carved her skills as a family nurse practitioner before coming into psychiatry. And when she used that word holistic, she's really talking about the fact that mental illness affects the body, the physical health, and so do medications. So we're trying to choose medications that aren't just going to make people feel better, but help them live longer, healthier lives and keep that depression or mania or insomnia from wrecking havoc on the body. So that's where we do a lot of thinking about lifestyle and natural treatments, because they can do that good for the body. And when we come to medications, the first thing is you're never going to take it if you can't afford it. So the good thing about generic medications is that they've been around for a long time, so we know how they work and we know the good and bad of them. New medications are brand name and can cost like a thousand dollars a month. A new medication is going to be brand name for about seven years before the price goes down and then it'll drop suddenly. So there are good reasons to use new medications. Sometimes the companies have simplified, purified the drug to improve on the side effects or make it work better. But there are also reasons to avoid them because we don't know as much about them and the cost issue. What we do at our center is we have a department to help people get those new medications authorized if they are brand name, and hopefully the insurance will authorize it. If not, there are programs we can connect people with if they make under a certain salary. The drug company might give them the supply for free. And finally, for anyone taking a medication, they may want to go to goodrx.com, which will tell them the cheapest price in their neighborhood scouring all the pharmacies for that. And you'll sometimes find that paying out of pocket is cheaper than using your insurance, that the drug might cost $5 while the copay is 20. Now that might make you scratch your head. Why is that? Well, there was a law they tried to pass in North Carolina to require the pharmacist to tell you that you could get it cheaper out of pocket, but that law never got passed. So instead, Silicon Valley created this GoodRx site to help people manage the cost of their medications better. And you asked about genetic testing. Genetic testing, I think, is the future, but right now the genes are way too complex to use. We had this great hope that understanding things like the serotonin receptor gene in the brain would lead to better choices of antidepressants. But it turned out to be a wash that um, when we looked at all the data, it didn't predict it at all. And in some people, it would, the, the med would work better, while in other people it would work worse with the same gene. How is that? Well, genes don't act on their own. And talking about a gene is a lot like talking about the color in a painting. And it would be kind of silly to say, the color blue makes me sad. Well, not if it's a painting of a blue sky, right? Or a happy person with some blue in her dress. So it's really how that color interacts with all the other colors in the painting that tells us how that color is gonna affect you. And the same thing with your genes. Your gene might do opposite things depending on what other genes are in your brain and the environment your brain is raised in. So it's just far too complex. But where genetic testing does help us is some people about 10 to 20 percent of people have differences in how they metabolize medications, particularly antidepressants, and they might get really high or really low blood levels. So if we see that kind of pattern, we might check the genetic test or we might just check the blood level to see where that's at. Did you have another question that I'm trying to remember? No, I think that was good. I'm going to go ahead and, and move forward and we'll pause in just a minute for some specific questions that people are sending in. So if you have a question at any point, um, go ahead and send that in. We'll be pausing periodically to do more questions. All right. So natural options are one of the things that I hear about and I get asked about quite a bit. And it usually goes one of several ways. Usually patients will either say, 
I don't actually want to take medication. <laughs> so they've come for their medication and visit and they're like, actually, I don't want medication. Tell me what you have that's natural. Or they may say, I've already tried all that. <laughs> the natural products in this country are typically going to be over the counter and patients can try them without prescription medication. And they may say, I don't want anything natural. I try that. That doesn't work for me. I want real medicine. And so what I want to do is to briefly tell you about how we do natural products in our practice and give you some resources. And I am going to touch on a few natural products just because I think there's a lot of buzz. You can look online. You you can be in blogs. There's lots of information on direct to consumers about this. So I want to make sure that we touch on a few of those really hot topics. So when it comes to natural products, it's true that in this country, they are usually over the counter and not FDA regulated. And so when we recommend a natural product, we want to be very careful that those products are research based and that there's data on efficacy as well as on safety and tolerability. And so oftentimes, because of the politics of healthcare in this country, we're actually looking at international studies to get the evidence that we need to know a product might actually be effective and has some safety data for it. And that doesn't mean that we're not using good research. Absolutely, we're looking for peer-reviewed, randomized controlled trials. We are lo really looking for the best evidence that we can have and until we have that we typically are going to avoid making recommendations about a natural product that said there are actually quite a few natural products where we have enough evidence and research that we're able to make those recommendations and have patients who have good success with that so one of the over-the-counter natural products that i get asked about the most is oral lavender and I'm going to go through several different natural products. If you're interested in more information about natural products, we actually have excellent handouts on our website. You can go to moodtreatmentcenter.com and click on self-help. So lavender is a natural product. It's actually a has an active ingredient called selexin in it. And selexin has been shown to be effective for anxiety, in, in Germany, it's actually a prescription medication. In comparison to the antidepressant Paxil and the research trials that they did, and we're talking about good clinical trials with large sample sizes, lavender actually outperformed Paxil for anxiety. And it is very well tolerated, much better tolerated than some of the antidepressant medications and the anxiety medications that we use. And so it's something that many patients find benefit from and tolerate very well. So I get asked, okay, well, the box just says take one to two a day, but could you be a little bit more specific about that? And so what I encourage my patients to do, the clinical trials that were done were done with a dose taking two capsules daily. And I like for patients to give that dose at least four weeks before they give up on it. And I encourage my patients to take it at night partly because the only side effect is a lavender aftertaste. So if you belch, you're gonna get this lavender taste. And I have patients that love it and I have patients that don't like it, but it's usually noticeable. And one of the advantages to taking it at night is just that you'll sleep through that and you won't notice it if you don't like it. I do have some patients that split the dose and they feel like that works better for them. That's not harmful at all. There's no discontinuation with lavender. So if you try lavender and you decide it's really not for you, it's not helpful, or maybe you really aren't tolerating that taste, although you should try it at night first if that happens, because usually that can be overcome. Um, but if for some reason you decide that it's not for you, you can absolutely just stop the lavender. It's not gonna cause any problems or any discontinuation symptoms. You can actually find this online. Um, there are resources for that. And again, at our website, moodtreatmentcenter.com, click on self-help. Okay, so another hot topic that I've been asked about quite a bit recently is saffron. So saffron is a spice. And in American cuisine, you probably recognize it the most as being the spice that turns your yellow rice yellow. And if you eat a lot of Middle Eastern dishes, it's often used in those dishes, but it is a spice. And it was recently presented at the International Bipolar Conference. And the international data showed evidence of efficacy for depression, 
focus and concentration, it actually performed as well as Ritalin, and also had some benefit in helping women's sexual dysfunction. And that's actually really exciting because we don't have anything else that can actually target all three aspects of women's sexual dysfunction. And by that, I mean libido, lubrication, and an ability to achieve orgasm. So again, if you're interested in more information, moodtreatmentcenter.com, click on self-help. So melatonin, I feel like we, if we talk about natural products, there's so many out there and trying to pick which ones we really want to focus on today. Um, I don't feel like you can have a presentation not to talk about melatonin because I think it's probably the one that patients have most often tried on their own before they come to me. Melatonin is very well tolerated and safe. It can be helpful for sleep onset and it also has uses for preventing migraine headaches and some other uses as well. But what I tell patients about melatonin is when we're talking about sleep, melatonin safe is absolutely fine to try. But what we're going to focus on a little bit more is going to be lifestyle. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. All right. So the last one that I felt like we had to cover, knowing we couldn't cover them all, is actually CBD. And before the quarantine, we were all at home. It seemed like every corner you turn, there was a new store selling CBD products. And I get asked about CBD quite a bit. And usually the conversation is, can I not just do CBD? And what I tell patients and, and people who ask me about this, friends and family, is that the research that we have is unfortunately at this time very limited. The research we have is very reassuring. So there doesn't seem to be a risk to it. The, the research that's been done is very promising. It's been looked at in a variety of different ways, but the research is not yet sufficient to make a good recommendation for it. So if I have a patient that's struggling with marijuana use or has used marijuana and felt like they had benefit from it and they're interested, then CBD would absolutely be a safer alternative at this point. That's what the research seems to be telling us. But more than that, I feel like we have to just constantly stay in the know, be pursuing and advocating for more research, but I'm not usually going further than that in recommendations at this time. I do think that's a hot topic and I think that more will be coming hopefully very soon about that. All right. The as needed medications. So after patients move from natural products, the next thing that they seem to consider the most often, and people ask me about this all the time is, if I, didn't, I don't want to take medication, but if I have to take medicine, can I just do it when I need it? Like, I don't, I don't want to need it all the time, and I don't, I don't think I need it all the time. Can I just do it every now and then? And typically, if a patient has come to our office, the likelihood is that they are having regular, frequent, significant symptoms that are interfering with their ability to function. Otherwise, we would not get involved. And the as needed medications are most often requested for anxiety. So anxiety is a normal human response. And the only reason it becomes a diagnosis and it becomes something that we treat medically is when it's interfering with functionality. And at that point, usually an as needed is not going to be the best treatment approach. So when patients ask me about as needed medications, the first thing I tell them is that we want to think of an as-needed medication as a preventative in certain very specific situations or as a rescue medication. And when we think about rescuing, if we're doing a good job with your medication management, we're going to really hope that you don't need rescuing. So when we think about that, the times when an as-needed medication might be most beneficial would be with performance anxiety. That's a great time for an as-needed medication. Now, if you are a public speaker every day and that's your full-time job, an as-needed might not be the best option. But for most people, they're not doing public speaking on a regular daily basis. And there are a couple medications that we can give beforehand that can reduce those physical symptoms of anxiety that happen in that scenario. So that racing heart and feeling like you're getting all tingly and chest tightness, and it can relieve those symptoms. We usually use a medication called propanolol, which is an old blood pressure medication that probably your mother or grandmother or, or someone in your family is taking for blood pressure or cardiac protection. 
um, but it's, a, it's an old medication. And what you can do is take it about an hour before public speaking or performance. And when it reduces those physical symptoms of anxiety, it is a lot easier for people to get those anxious thoughts back under control. So that's a good medication. We do have to watch, obviously, because it is a blood pressure medication. We have to make sure it doesn't make somebody's blood pressure or heart rate get too low, which can make them dizzy or tired. But most patients can find a dose that they can tolerate and will work very well from them. Um, another time that patients might take an as needed medication is a medication called gabapentin. We use gabapentin for as needed anxiety. And sometimes this can be helpful before social um, interactions, um, it's useful for sleep as well. A lot of patients will say that their anxiety gets worse in the evening, and that's a medication that actually helps the brain um, sleep architecture be more productive. So that's a different medication that we can try. And then the other medications that I think people are most often asking about are really the benzodiazepines. And those medications are a lot more complicated. They have some more risks. They work very well, um, but they're not the easiest to take for several different reasons. And so I know that that is the hot topic. That's the one that you really want to hear about the most. And so what I'm going to tell you about that one for right now is that when we use that medication, our goal is to use the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time possible and to also have a strategy to help, strategy to help patients not need those medications. Dr. Aiken is going to speak in a lot of detail about that when we get to medication about anxiety. And I know you have several questions. So I'm going to get to that point and we're going to pause again and we'll make sure that we cover your questions. Okay. So let's pause before we go much further and let's take some of the questions that we've been getting. I'm going to answer some and then I'm going to give some for Dr. Aiken as well. And we'll see if we can't find some answers to what's interesting you the most. All right, we've got several here. Um, some of these I will be answering as we go along, so bear with me just a second while I look and see what you've asked. All right, so one of the questions goes back to when we were talking about therapy. And the question is, I need therapy, but I can't afford it at this time. What should I do? That is an excellent question. I think that that is one of the most common reasons patients have for not doing therapy. I think it's very understandable. It is legitimate and it is tricky because when we do therapy sessions, most patients are going to come weekly, maybe um, every other week. It depends on the person. And that session is going to be for an hour and they are going to pay a copay for that. So every area is a little bit different and what is available to people as a as a resource for therapy. Some areas are very rural and they don't even have a lot of providers. But there's a couple resources that you can look into when you're struggling with costs, but you know that therapy is really going to be important. One, most areas, even very rural areas, will usually have a community mental health center that offers therapy on a sliding scale. The second avenue would be if your area has training facilities associated with the university, you can often get um, assistance that way. Students in training can provide great services, they have excellent supervision, and they're usually seeing patients at a free or reduced cost. So that's another resource. And then the other resource that I encourage patients to use is actually psychologytoday.com. In our area, the therapists tend to keep their information up to date, and it will actually list out for you on their profile what insurances they take, that's a very important question. If they don't take insurance, what their fees are, and if they accept sliding scale. So that can be a great resource to find affordable options. All right, so um, Dr. Aiken, I'm gonna let you do this one since you talked about genetic testing. Um, one of the questions that we got, is genetic testing worthwhile if you have been treatment resistant for 30 years? I think that's a great one because there's some uh, some extra modalities that we do, and I'll let you answer that one. Yes, we often do genetic testing if someone isn't responding well to treatments. It's particularly useful for non-bipolar depression. Bipolar medications, the genetic testing doesn't tell us much, but in fact, for most bipolar medications, we simply check the blood levels, so we don't need the genes to tell us what your blood level might be. We can go right in and check it. And we also check something else that's 
been found to predict response to medications even better than genetic testing is we test if the person has inflammation. It's called a C-reactive protein. And if it's high, it means that a lot of inflammatory gunk, the kind of stuff that causes fever and infection feelings, is getting into their brain and causing depression. And that can lead us in a different treatment direction. All right. So another question um, that I got was about the natural products that we spoke about earlier. And there were two questions. I'm going to go ahead and do these because I think these are great questions. Um, one of the questions was, how do you manage whether the natural treatments are going to interact with your medications? And that sometimes we recommend actually specific brands for a natural product and how would we gauge the potency of that and should people consult with their provider before they try something natural all right so those are great questions in our practice we actually utilize a special resource to really help us know how to recommend specific products to patients and, and their families and their loved ones. And the reason that we, we have to do that is because in this, this country, the, the herbal products are not FDA regulated. And so companies have the option, if they make a natural product, to submit themselves to testing through consumer labs. And they will test not for efficacy, that comes from our research trials, but will test a product to make sure that the ingredients are as stated, meaning that it does have what it's supposed to have in it, and it doesn't have any extra ingredients that should not be in it. And so when we make specific brand recommendations, those are going to be products that have put themselves through that testing. Companies have to pay to do that testing. We have to pay to access that data. So I don't ever want to um, imply that there's maybe not good products out there that haven't been tested because there absolutely may be. They may have, for financial reasons, have chosen not to go through that process. But as a provider, when I'm talking to my family and friends and the patients that I see, I'm going to stick with what has that proven data. And so that is why when you see a specific brand mentioned on our website, that's why we, we use that brand. Um, you absolutely should talk to your healthcare provider about different supplements because there is the potential for some interactions with medications and natural supplements. I think St. John's wort is the one that has gotten the most attention for that because it was so commonly used for a while. Um, a lot of teas were putting it in it naturally and then they all had to come back and be stamped with a warning that it shouldn't be combined with antidepressant medications. So that information is evolving um, and we are constantly working to stay up to date on on those things that could interact with your medications and, and look at that interplay. So it's always a great idea when we say, is there anything that you take from your other provider? or any supplements or anything that you're taking on your own, it's really helpful if you share that information. Sometimes we can really help streamline that. Sometimes I look at what patients are taking and they're they're spending a lot of money on the things that aren't really gonna be have the best evidence. And so if we're gonna spend money on supplements and, and natural products, you wanna make sure that patients are getting the benefit of those. So absolutely let your provider know and we will work with you um, to make sure that what you're getting is what you need and that you're not getting anything that can be harmed to you? That's a great question. All right, so let's talk a little bit about medications. We have a lot to get through. Um, keep sending those questions in. We're going to pause again for questions in just a minute. To do that, as a reminder, the bottom right hand of your screen, you can submit questions. And if you're using a phone, there's a question button at the bottom of your screen. All right, so when it comes to medications and mental health, this is something else that's a little bit different than medical medications that we think of for physical illnesses. And that is that the different classes of medications are actually used for a lot of different diagnoses. So there's some overlap. And when we think about that, we don't just think of it from a class perspective, because once you think of a class of medications, you also have to think about the individual medications that are in that class. And there can be quite a bit of difference there. But for example, just so that you kind of understand that there is some interplay here and some of the medicines we're going to talk about are going to overlap with other diagnoses. We use antidepressants for depression, for anxiety, for OCD. We use some for binge eating disorder, 
Prozac being the one that we think of for that. Um, so there's some overlap there. We use antipsychotic medications for psychotic syndromes. We also use them for treatment resistant depression and we use them as mood stabilizers and bipolar disorder. We use mood stabilizers for OCD, for treatment resistant depression. We use them for bipolar disorder, for mania as well as depression. And then when we think about anxiety and ADHD, those symptoms go with a lot of different conditions. And what we want to remember is we're trying to use as few medications as possible. So when you talk to your medication provider and they say, I think this might be helpful, and you say, I don't know about that, I really only have this problem, they can help you understand the rationale for why they're choosing that medication. But there is a little bit of overlap and several different types of medications have multiple uses, okay? So trying to find out what's gonna be the best approach is gonna always be aimed at what's gonna most treat the underlying condition. Some patients have more than one condition and trying to use as few medications as possible to help the patients feel all the way well, meaning that they're functional and that they are feeling like themselves again. All right. So let's talk about the antidepressants because those are the medications that I think people um, have heard about the most. These are common medications that with direct-to-consumer advertisements you have probably heard about from your friends, your family, or even yourself. And when we think about those medications, there are several questions that I get every time I talk about antidepressants. So I'm gonna go through those. Um, when we think about the antidepressants, keep in mind, we use them more than for just depression. So the first thing patients will say when I say antidepressant is, I don't really need that, I'm just anxious. And we as a society are very comfortable being anxious, but we are not comfortable being depressed. And the stigma of mental health is really strong. So one of the things that when we talk about medications, we're gonna talk about that as well. So with the antidepressants, keep in mind, we use them for more than just depression. But the questions that I get the most often when we've decided that that might be a good treatment approach is first, is this going to make me suicidal? I don't want to be suicidal. I don't want my loved one to be suicidal. And that is a serious safety concern that we pay close attention to. The good news is that Although there is a black box warning on antidepressant medications about suicidal ideation, especially in our younger young adult or adolescent patients, there is better long-term research since that black box warning was put into effect. It's very reassuring. So many of the patients that I see or their loved ones have experienced suicidal thoughts in some capacity. And what we know is that if we do not treat depression, patients are going to be at risk for suicide. And what we expect with the antidepressants is only that their mood is going to improve and that as their mood improves, the suicidal thoughts will also improve. Now, it doesn't work that antidepressants prevent suicide. Lithium is the only thing that we know of that does that. But when it comes to suicidal thoughts, the things that I want people to know is that if they develop a new or worsening suicidal thoughts when they're taking antidepressant medication, A, that's very rare, very unlikely. But if it happens, they should know how to reach out to me and they will be perfectly capable of doing that. So at every visit, I'm gonna ask about suicidal thoughts and before I prescribe any medication that can be in the class of the antidepressants, I'm gonna make sure that they know the emergency resources. So if that rare event happens, they know exactly how to get help right away. Okay, so that's the first question. The second question that I get is probably, is this going to make me gain weight? And again, we don't ever want a patient, their love or their family, we don't want anybody to have to trade one problem for another problem. I would say that when it comes to the antidepressants, there is a risk for weight gain, but most people are not going to experience that. The exception to that is Wellbutrin. So Wellbutrin, um, the generic for that is Bupropion, but most people have heard of the brand name because of the commercials. Um, that is a medication that does not cause weight gain. So one of the advantages to that medication is the lack of weight gain. The others can cause varying amounts of weight gain. Usually it's going to be very mild and it varies from person to person. 
I would say the majority of my patients won't have any weight gain. But what I do to make sure that we're watching for that is that I see patients in close follow-up. So when they first start an antidepressant medication, I'm going to check in quickly so that if we see that weight gain is a problem, we're going to do something different. Okay. So weight gain is a concern. Nobody wants to have it. I don't think in any way that that fear should keep you from taking a medication that might be really helpful for depression. Some things to remember about depression, once depression is better, patients tend to have better motivation. They're able to be more physically active. They get better control over their eating and their emotional eating, and that can be very helpful for weight overall. All right, so the other question that I get anytime we talk about an antidepressant is people ask, is this gonna give me those sexual side effects? And that one is super awkward and personal and nobody likes to ask it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, I hear that all the time. And that is actually a common side effect with the exception of Wellbutrin. So when we think about the other antidepressants, what we wanna remember is that they can cause sexual side effects. And just like anything else, as far as side effects goes, you just need to let your provider know. We have strategies to decrease or stop the sexual side effects. We have alternative medications that we can use. And when we say sexual side effects, what we're usually referring to is a delayed ability to achieve orgasm. And again, nobody wants to share that information. So I always just say, be aware, if this is happening to you and it's a problem, I don't want your relationships impacted because that's gonna impact your mood. Just let me know, okay? So there are more options to antidepressants than are listed on this screen. Um, I do tell patients, we've gotten a lot of questions about genetic testing. I think it's very helpful. If you happen to know that everybody in your family takes Prozac and that's the medicine that's worked well for them or Celexa or whichever one that it is, that's helpful information to share with your provider. All right. So the analytics. I am going to actually turn this one over to Dr. Aiken, and we're going to finally get to the, the topic that I know a lot of people have questions about, and that is going to include the benzodiazepines. And Dr. Aiken, someone sent in a question also about how they can reduce and stop using medications that they feel dependent on. So if you don't mind, also answer that question when you talk to us about the medicines we use for anxiety. Okay, so the thing I remember most about medical school, well, a lot of things, but one stood out, is that nobody goes to the doctor unless they have anxiety. And that's true in psychiatry and in general medicine. I mean, if you have a rash on your arm, but you're not worried about it, you're probably not going to go see the doctor. But if you're anxious about it, you will. So anxiety is what drives us to do things, including come for help. And what that means is that nearly every psychiatric problem from ADHD, where you can't finish your work, to bipolar, where you're hyper and can't sleep all night, is going to cause anxiety. So our first step in treating anxiety is to find out the underlying cause and treat that, and then the anxiety will get better. There's also things called anxiety disorders. And those are like generalized anxiety where people worry about everything all the time, can't stop worrying. There's phobias where people avoid things and post-traumatic stress where a terrible life event causes a anxiety that they live with for a long time. But anxiety disorders are better thought of as disorders of avoidance or phobia. In other words, the real problem is that they're avoiding something all the time and what they're often avoiding is the anxiety itself. So what that means is that something surprising, although anxiety is often felt physically more than most other symptoms, you know, the racing heart, the tremor, the dry mouth, it actually gets better with therapy more so than with meds. And I'm speaking now for the anxiety disorders, all the ones I mentioned. They actually respond a lot better to therapy with the behavioral component, reducing avoidance, the lifestyle change, and that changes the brain and the body more than meds do there. Now, in terms of benzodiazepines, those are medicines that treat nearly every type of anxiety, no matter what the cause. So they're naturally a go-to medication when anxiety is so intense that you might go to the emergency room over it. And they should be thought of that way. The way I look at benzodiazepines is 
they're one of the few medicines we give that aren't good for people. We, like I said, we try to use medicines that are good for the brain and good for long-term health. Benzodiazepines are not. They increase the risk of overdose when combined with other meds like opioids, a big problem in our society today, people dying from that. They increase anxiety and sleep problems long-term, even though they help them short-term. And they make it harder to think and manage stress. They reduce your cognitive abilities with long-term use. And that's exactly what you need to break through anxiety is to be able to manage stress. So as the benzos do a number of problems, they worsen memory, various things, but they're not that bad. I don't want people who take them to feel bad about taking them. What you do need to know is they're not good for you, so we wanna minimize that dose as much as we can, use them only when necessary. And that gets into how to come off them. And we don't have a magic recipe for how to come off of them. Nobody's really figured out the answer there other than lowering it slowly and lowering it as you tolerate that. We have found a lot of success in our practice using the lavender silexin for the anxiety while lowering them down. Now, Heather also wisely mentioned that antidepressants treat anxiety, and that is true. They treat a lot of the anxiety disorders and they're not addictive, so they don't wear off over time. And then we have only one medicine that's just for anxiety is buspirone. And that's one that has almost no side effects and no addiction, so worth trying there. All right, thank you, Heather. All right. So we are getting a lot of questions. We appreciate your questions. I may not be able to get through all of them during this presentation, but we will definitely review them at the end of the webinar, and we'll look for another platform to make sure that we can get your questions answered. All right, when it comes to the mood stabilizers, these are probably the medications that I find most often have not been prescribed in a patient that maybe needs them. And so good candidates for mood stabilizing medications are those patients that feel like they live on a roller coaster. So if they say, I don't know who I'm going to be in the morning. My partner doesn't know who I'm going to be in the morning. And I feel like some days I'm the lamb, some days I'm the, li the lion. And my energy can be, I won't get out of bed some days. And then some days I am hop around everywhere. These are patients that might benefit from mood stabilizers. Other patients that might really benefit from mood stabilizers are patients who have tried um, multiple antidepressants and just not had success. So at our job, what we really try to do is remember that people don't fit in boxes. So we have diagnostic criteria and we use that as a guide, but we have to look at the patient. We have to look at their history, their risk factors, family history, and what's worked or not worked for them. And oftentimes when someone has not found success, mood stabilizers might be the piece that's missing. Now these medications vary quite a bit. And so I've listed some common ones on the slide for you, but they each could be their own presentation. The thing to remember is that when patients or people, if you're sitting at home and you think, I've tried everything already, very often you really have it. And it's a good time to check in with a medication provider because there are lots of options in the mood stabilizers that might be very, very beneficial. These medicines sometimes are just life changing. All right. Okay. So when it comes to the antipsychotic medications, these are medications that patients will, when I say, I think you might benefit from an antipsychotic medication, they kind of get that deer in headlights look in their face or if their family member, a family member may call and say, why, why did you put my loved one on this medicine? I saw a commercial that is an antipsychotic. And the question that I get most often when we talk about these medications is, oh my goodness, do you think I'm crazy? Or am I that bad? Are my symptoms that bad? And oftentimes what patients are really asking or what they're really thinking is, does this mean I'm not fixable? Does this mean I'm not lovable or that I'm broken or that I am too complicated to recover? And that's not what that means at all. If I were in charge, 
if I were in charge, we would not have described these medications as antipsychotics because we actually use these medications for a variety of conditions. And these medications are the ones where I'm most often going to maybe consider at some point a brand name medication because there is quite a bit of difference in the individual medications under this big umbrella. So when you see those commercials or you hear those thoughts or you talk to friends or Google about medications and you hear the word antipsychotic, even if your symptoms are not psychotic in nature, keep in mind that these options can be very, very helpful. And with good medication management, they can be well tolerated. Now they are like the mood stabilizers a little bit more complex and that there can be some lab monitoring for those medications, but that's something that you can absolutely work out with your medication provider and is really pretty simplistic once you get into it. So things that I have heard as answer to the question about does this mean I can't be fixed or does this mean I'm so severe? People have told me when they've started these medications that it's the first time that their thoughts were clear in years. They have said those intrusive thoughts have finally gotten quiet so that I can do what I need to do again. And sometimes people will come back and they will say, I don't really ever want to stop this medication. So when we talk about dur duration of treatment with mental health medications, it really varies. It varies on how often patients have had symptoms, how often, um, how severe the symptoms have been for people, what type of symptoms they've had. And so there's actually quite a few variables that go into that. Patients that truly have psychotic disorders are gonna do well with these medications on a long-term basis. And what we do is we watch closely to make sure they don't develop complications from them. And those complications are not impossible, but they're rare and with good medication management is something that can hopefully be avoided. So when we think about that, the key is to just stay connected. And if you go in and you have questions, just let your provider know. We're glad to answer questions just like we are today. All right, the sedatives. So if there was ever a time that I was going to say, when a patient says, I really need medicine for that, I'm for, for sleep, I'm going to almost always say, you need to do lifestyle modification because the best treatment for sleep is to one, treat the underlying cause for why somebody's not sleeping. If you are having symptoms of mania, putting a sleeping medicine as a Band-Aid on top is really not gonna be helpful. We really need to control that mood disorder and get patients where they're feeling better. But the number one thing that for anybody, regardless of why they're having trouble with sleep is gonna actually be lifestyle modification. And on our website, if you go to moodtreatmentcenter.com and click on self-help, we have so many tricks and tips that are research-based, very effective methods that can improve sleep. Some of them sound actually kind of silly, like the blue light glasses, but they work very well. And so I would encourage you to check that out. And before you rush in desperation, and I understand that because sleep deprivation is a recognized form of torture for a reason. So patients feel desperate when they're not sleeping. I know if I don't get my good eight hours, I am not happy. But before you rush to medication, this is actually one of those times where lifestyle modification is gonna be your best treatment. Okay, the ADHD medications. Um, this is also kind of a webinar in of itself. The stimulant medications like the benzodiazepines are controlled substances and they have some risks. And for some of our patients, they're just not gonna be well tolerated. They're gonna aggravate some of their other symptoms such as bipolar disorder or anxiety or insomnia. So the key to know about ADHD, what I get asked a lot is, when I was little, I took medication and my family didn't like how it affected me. They felt like I wasn't myself anymore. And so I've just never taken medication, but I'm not really functional. Or maybe um, patients have tried somebody else's medication and they felt like it was helpful. So they want to try that medication. So these are actually um, complicated issues that really need to kind of be delved into with a medication provider. But the important thing to know is that ADHD can significantly impair functioning, which is what we're really trying to improve. And if you're struggling with those symptoms and ultimately your mood is managed and it really seems 
happens to be ADHD and that diagnosis has been looked at, you do have options other than stimulant medications, and we have strategies to make sure you can tolerate your stimulants if that's what you need, okay? So once again, the key is just staying connected, open, and asking those questions. All right, so really quickly before we disconnect, troubleshooting your medications. When you have trouble actually taking the medication, remembering the medication, or you just quit your medication, lots of reasons why people might do that, there is no judgment when you are working with your medication provider. Let them know if you are struggling. We have all kinds of tricks and tips that can help you be successful with taking medication. And that's an important part of the care because it actually works better if you take the medicine. So we will look over the questions that we've gotten and we'll try to find an avenue to make sure that we get all of them answered. Thank you for sending them in and thank you for joining us today.